congregation has intentionally put up a barrier <laughs> to prevent me from drifting downhill. Well, I have you know I'm on to you. And so is Jesus. I'm kidding. It is a good barrier. It is. And if I don't let those things stop me, I'd never get a great parking space at the mall. <laughs> Kidding. Mark, chapter 16. We will conclude our sermon series in Mark. Watch how stealthily, look at this, they even wrapped the cord underneath the other one to where I couldn't move it as easily. Mark chapter 16, but as you are moving there, or turning there, I will be moving these things out of my pacing way. Mark chapter 16. Left siders. Mark chapter 16. We'll also be looking at John chapter 20. I, you say, but it's not in the bulletin. Yeah, I know. Every now and then I like to mix it up and not tell y'all. So, Mark chapter 16, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 8. And then we'll jump over and look at John chapter 20, 1 through 16. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices that they might come to anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw the stone had been rolled away. And it was extremely large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right, wearing a white robe. And they were amazed. And he said to them, do not be amazed. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who has been crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold, here is the place where they laid him. But go and tell his disciples and Peter. He is going to be going before them to Galilee. And there you will see him, just as he said to you. And they went and they fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had gripped them. Go ahead and put my bookmark back there so I won't get lost. Notice what happens here in Mark chapter 16. Now Mark and Luke record things that John and Matthew do not. And this is what we call the synoptic, one of the synoptic reasons is where the Gospels kind of all have a, a, a story that they record and they record a lot of the same details. And if you were in a young adult class, some of this will be reviewed because Raymond Harris ruined my sermon for me. <laughs> there, I just said it. I'm kidding. And so Matthew records things that John does not. Mark records. Mark, as we talked about from the very beginning, Mark, Jesus has track shoes on. He just running from the next place to the next place to the next place. So Mark records a couple of things, and then Luke records a few more. And when you look at them all together, you get a fuller look at the whole crucifixion event. Mark and Luke record that they bring spices to the tomb. Well, that's kind of odd. Right? For the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at Jesus telling them, I am going to die. As a matter of fact, the last time we looked, he says, Jesus, is, I am going to be betrayed, handed over to the Jewish officials, convicted, condemned to death, turned over to the Gentiles to be scourged, beaten, spat upon, die, and be resurrected. And yet, they bring spices. You find that odd? Let's look over at John. Look over to John. And notice also, though, before we get there, the astonishment at what they hear the angel say. He's not here. What? You want to figure out what that astonished look looks like? Guys, that look on your wife's face when you unload the dishwasher and reload it without her saying. <gasps> and then, what did you do? Right? Anyhow, back to it. 
John chapter 20. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb. It was still dark. She saw the stone was already rolled away from the tomb. And she ran, and, and so she ran and came to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved. That would be John. John almost always refers to himself as the disciple Jesus loves. They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Therefore Peter went forth with the other disciple, and they were going to the tomb together, and the two were running together, and one of the disciples ran faster than Peter. By the way, this is, of course, a consternation in the, in the young adult class. Who was the fastest guy? And we said Peter won because John stopped at the door and the race was to the tomb. And Peter runs in. And ran had faster. And Peter came to the tomb first and stooped and looked in and then, uh, to see where he was lying. But he, did not go in, or sorry, but he did not go in. And so Simon Peter therefore also came and followed him and entered into the tomb. And he beheld the linen wrapped lying there. And the face cloth which was on his head lying in the linen and the wrapping rolled up in its place by itself. And the other disciple who had come first to the tomb entered and also they saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. So the disciples went away again to their own home. But Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping and she wept and stooped and looked into the tomb. And she beheld two angels in white linen, one at the head and one at the foot where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said, Because they have taken away the Lord, and I do not know where they have taken him and laid him. <coughs> and when she had said this, she turned around, and behold, Jesus was standing there and did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And supposing him to be the gardener. She said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I may take, care, take him away. And he said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him, in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Look at the situation. Now, if you were here at Sunrise Service, some of this will be review. If you weren't, some of this will be new. They believed that he was coming to inaugurate a kingdom on earth. And when he was killed on the cross on Friday, they took his body down. They prepped it like it was supposed to be the way you would prep a normal body. They put it in a tomb that was the place where normal bodies go. And they rolled a stone in front of it. Matthew records that they then go, or the Jews go, and ask for a guard detail to be put on the tomb to guard the tomb. This is something you do when someone dies. It is curious behavior for someone to do for an individual who four times in the book of Mark has said, I am going to die... But in three days, I will rise again from the dead. So he makes this prophecy. Just as Jonah spends three days in the belly of the fish, so the Son of Man will spend three days in the grave. It's the third day. And notice, on the third day, what was the response to the death of Christ? We're bringing spices to anoint a dead body. See, the women come to the tomb not to see a risen Lord, but to put spices on a corpse. Now, I've heard this preach. I saw a guy this week just totally blow it hermeneutically. Just, it was, uh, bad preaching is, is just, it's like nails on a chalkboard to another passage. Ah! It's, it's, it's like kryptonite. And the individual, and he was very, very, very enthusiastic. You can see how I drifted back down here? No. It went like this. They came to keep all traces of foulness away from the name of Jesus. They came to bring ointments to put on there to where the Romans couldn't smell it and laugh at their God. I find that very curious. They just came 
Because they're expecting a body to be in there. Because that's what you do when someone dies. Notice that the disciples, when the Mary come to them and say, hey, he's not in the tomb, they don't go, well, of course he's not in the tomb. He said in the third day he would rise. What's your problem? No, they didn't do that. What was their reaction? Well, let's go look, right? How many of y'all been a looky loo in an accident, right? Somebody has an accident on the far side of the road and you just kind of... And then we're amazed that we get in a wreck. They go to the tomb. Peter and John foot race to the tomb not to see the risen Lord. The text tells us that. They go in there and they look. And they're in a quandary. They believe, but yet they don't fully understand as Scripture is to be real. Kind of like the Roman centurion that says, I believe, help my unbelief. They're kind of stuck in this quandary. Well, he did say he would raise from the dead, but, but he died. Dead people don't rise again. Notice the language that Mary Magdalene refers to them with when they go to see them. Notice what she says here in John. Chapter 20, verse 2. They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb. And we do not know where they have laid him. What are they looking for when they go to the tomb? Are they coming to look for the risen Lord? Are they coming to see the Christ who has raised from the dead, who brings in his own kingdom in which he has conquered both death and sin, and now we have access to the Father through the death, burial, and resurrection? Or are they coming to see a dead body and astonished that the body is not there? And the natural response to the supernatural action is they've moved him. They've moved him. Peter and John run to the tomb, foot race. Last one to the tomb is a rotten egg. And they look inside the tomb. They see the linen. They see the door rolled away. And they're still kind of, huh? Peter. James and John were the first ones to hear from Jesus' own mouth that he was going to be killed and that he was going to be resurrected. And yet they still didn't get it. Still blinded to the fact that they were expecting the Messiah of Isaiah 7 through 11, not the Isaiah of 53. Drop down a little bit. So the other disciple who was with him came first, entered the tomb, and saw and believed, for yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. So the disciples went their way to their own homes. Essentially, basically what they did was they looked, they said, they, well, this seems to be true. They don't fully yet realize the scripture is being fulfilled. And then instead of going and telling the others, they go home. Had an encounter with the empty tomb. And their reaction is, I'll go home. But Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping. As she wept, she looked in, she sees two angels. They said, woman, down to verse 13, why are you weeping? She said, because they've taken away my Lord and I do not know where they've laid him. She still is insistent on the fact that they've played three car Monte with the body of Jesus. And he's no longer in this grave, but in another grave. And we don't know where he's at. Now, if I saw two men in the tomb that looked like angels, 
and I made that statement to them, I'd be a little weirded out. But notice what they said. And when she turned around, sorry, they didn't speak in here in John, they speak in the other, in the other Gospels. And when she turned around, beheld, Jesus was standing there. And she didn't know it was Jesus. Now, why does she recognize this Jesus? Here's the thing. I, I, I'm a fairly common looking individual. I've got this thing growing on my face and it makes me a little bit less noticeable to the FBI. And so I keep going that way. Um, and and I, have a, I, I have no doubt that, that you could probably pick me out of a lineup even, even if I go away for a while. I ran to a chaplain I knew years ago. And he go, hey, Ashley, how are you doing? And I put on a little bit of weight and I had facial hair. But yet he could spot me instantaneously. Why? I've got a certain look about me. And yet, here is Jesus talking to Mary and she doesn't recognize him. And the excuse typically is, well, she's crying. You have to be doing a lot of crying. Well, I, when I went through Officer Basic, they sent us to the gas chamber, and we had to take our mask off. And uh, when you come out of there, your eyes can't see anything, and it's just it's horrible. I, that would be the level of tearing you would have to have. But yet the voice should sound similar. But yet it can't be him. Why can't it be Jesus in front of me? Where is he? He's been moved. His body is still in the grave. He has been moved. His body's not here. This guy, though, sounds eerily like Jesus. Can't be. He's dead. So notice what she addresses him as. And she said, and turned around and standing there, and, sorry, but hell, it was Jesus standing there. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And supposing him to be the gardener. Actually, I would think more of a grave robber, but okay, the gardener. I didn't know that was a gardener's task. If I'm ever your gardener, it does not include the removal of dead bodies. Supposing him to be the gardener. I don't think that was the job of the gardener, but okay, rock on. Supposing him to be the gardener. She says to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Why is she there? Is she there to see a risen Lord? Or is she there to see a body? She brought the spices to anoint a body. The ladies were wondering how they were going to get in to the tomb and who would roll the stone so they could get in to anoint a body. They go and tell the disciples that they have moved his body. She presumes the man before her, who is Christ himself, as the one who has moved the body. And asks, where's the body? You say, wow. You would think somewhere along the line, it would have dawned through their mind that when he said three days and I'll rise, that they would have glatched on to that. Jesus talks to her. She's standing there looking at him. And finally, Jesus says to her, Mary. And then she recognizes him. And we know the rest of the story that he then goes and he meets with the twelve and they see the risen body. And we know the story of doubting Thomas who says, unless I can put my hands here, and in the side, I'm not believing you guys because you guys are pranksters. But notice the immediate reaction on that very first Easter morning. It was not he is risen, he is risen indeed. It's where's the body, where's the body, where's the body, where's the body. We've brought spices for the body. The women came to the tomb 
to anoint a corpse, believing that's where it was. The disciples come to the tomb to confirm what the women have said, that the body is not there. And they walk away bewildered and yet not fully understanding. Mary has a conversation with Jesus Christ and doesn't comprehend who it is because he's supposed to be in the ground. People come to the empty tomb all the time. We are here today to celebrate resurrection morning. And many of us come. And, but why do we come to see the Christ of the empty tomb? Some come merely for academic pursuit. And if you've ever been on Facebook during Easter time, you see this back and forth of, oh, no, they moved him. The guards fell asleep and the Jews moved him. Here's the thing, folks. For guards, Roman guards, to fall asleep on duty, it was automatic death sentence. It was an automatic death sentence. So when the priests had them lie, these men were taking their own lives in their own hands. And if the men were lying and the priests were willing to pay to cover it up, then the Jews at that time recognized that the body of Christ had risen. And to cause doubt, they have it. Every year around Easter time, there's a group event called the Jesus Seminar. And it's a funny name because they have very little to do with Jesus and a lot to do with seminars. And they work very hard on disproving the legitimacy of Christ's resurrection and the work of Christ and the fact that he is the divine son of God who has come. And for them, the empty tomb and the risen Lord is an academic pursuit one to dispel. And for others on, on, on the conservative side, the risen Lord and the empty tomb is an academic pursuit to vindicate and to eradicate that argument and nothing more. There are some here today who come to Christ to see the Christ of the empty tomb merely simply because it is an insurance policy. In 2005, when I was in Iraq, we had soldiers that were going to convoy from um, Kuwait up to Baghdad. Many of them very concerned, new, fairly green troops, worried about death. Death has a funny thing. It makes you want to have a closer relationship with God for while you're at proximity to death. <coughs> Came to chapel. Chapel was full. Man, preaching was great. Because you had a full house of people were there. They were there because they were scared. Go to the hospital. To an individual who's on a deathbed. And they just to make sure. Well, I want to I be a Christian just to hedge my bet. See, the Christ in the empty tomb for them is an insurance policy. And nothing more. He is, exists not to be risen, not to be lord of their life, not to be master of their life, but just hedging their bets. Just hedging their bets. Others come to the Christ of the empty tomb, believing that the tomb really isn't empty because God does not have the power, Christ does not have the power to affect my life. He, certainly I have a life that God is inept or incapable of helping and it's demonstrated in the actions in which we have, in which we speak of God. God, you apparently do not see how bad I have it down here on earth. Yeah, I see how bad you have it. And there are others that have it worse. We live a defeated Christianity because we have the assumption that while Jesus has risen from the dead, he doesn't care about me. And so the resurrection applies to others, but it does not apply to me. And so we live a defeated Christianity, a Christianity that assumes that the Lord is still where he is. A Christianity like the pagans have. 
a belief system like the pagans have, that believe that their God is a fickle God that allows them to twist and blow within the, we, in, in the wind and has no concern about them whatsoever. And yet, the Bible tells us that this God, the God-man, was so concerned about you and I that the Father sends the Son into the world before He creates. He, his intention is the Son will come to die, not for humanity, but for you and I. And for yours and my sin, not for sin globally, but sin specifically, sin yours, sin mine. And to live a life as though that isn't applied to you is a defeated Christianity and implies that that Christ is still there in the grave. Then there are some that come to the grave or to the, or to the risen Lord or to the risen Christ recognizing that what he does by rising from the dead ensures and guarantees for us salvation and a restored relationship with the Father because through the death, the burial, and the resurrection, we now have a great high priest, as Hebrew says, that makes one atonement for all sin. And then he sits down, completed action, doesn't get back up again, doesn't get re-sacrificed again, doesn't have to come and spill his blood again. One time, complete offering, sits down, completed action, does not get up at the right hand of the Father, and he mediates for us before the Father. Why do you come to the tomb of the risen Lord? Why do you come to celebrate the risen Christ? Is he merely an academic pursuit? Something cool to kick around around Easter time, but after that, eh, I show up to church when I want because it's not really real. It's kind of cool to play with. And then I'll put God back up on the shelf and walk away. Why do you come to the risen Lord? Do you come to the Christ of the empty tomb because he is an insurance policy? And once you have that, well, I'll just play Russian roulette with my life and I've got my insurance policy over here. And everything is hunky-dory because I'm in. Folks, that's more along the line of what Catholics would call an indulgence. I paid good money to where the Pope would eliminate my sin, and the money has no value, and the piece of paper that they bought had even less. Or do you come to the tomb? Do you come to the Christ of the empty tomb? Because you recognize the sinful nature of yourself. And the self-sacrificing love of God that hung in your place, that took upon His body your crime, said there alone upon that tree, in agony taking your punishment, and in recognition of that great salvation, accepted Him as Lord and Savior of your life. Why do you approach the Christ of the empty tomb? Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank You for this day. We thank You for those who are here. But more importantly, Heavenly Father, we thank You for the sending of the Son who through the death, burial, and resurrection of the Son, we now have the means to have a restored relationship and a pure and clean heart through the washing of the blood of Jesus. We thank you for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and we ask for your blessing upon us as we leave here today. We ask for these things in your name we pray. Amen. If you please stand with me.